You want to sit down and make sure you're in frame here? Yeah, make sure it looks really good. So the thing about rock climbing is that it's really fucking cool. <laughs> Little red buttons on. Oh, let's see. All right, do you want me to sit in yours to make sure that this other one is working for you or? Yeah, let's do that. Looks like it's probably better that uh, red button's on. That'll work. <laughs> oh my gosh. Spilling water. No, no. It's okay, most of it's on my notebook. All right. And do you have you, that thing's on? That thing's on. The Why little not? red button has been pressed. Cool. On all the things we're we're re we're recording. We can kind of just like warm up for a second and then. I feel I'll so just nervous. Like cut. Is this, big one? <laughs> is this like is this like a TED talk? How many <laughs> how many recorded interviews have you done? Do you think? Uh, hundreds. I don't know. Hundreds. Yeah. Surely. Yeah. I mean, so many. Because just a uh, one tour, like the free solo film tour, is probably probably hundreds just by itself yeah totally any that stand out to you i mean specific interviews yeah no but i mean in terms of public speaking there's definitely specific things like giving a ted talk and stuff like that where you're super nervous and super hardcore yeah but not another at all yeah, i mean there's just so much did you take I, I was talking to lisi about this lisi set this whole thing up thanks to lisi um you like took courses in in like interviewing and speaking and stuff like that as like part of your professional no. development no, that would be a that would be an overstatement. Okay. Uh, so the North Face once provided a speech coach basically as a one day thing, as a bit of an experiment. I think they were trying to see if it was a worthwhile investment for the athlete team uh, to have sort of some expertise available. And in this particular case, it happened to be right before I was supposed to give a TED talk, so it was actually incredibly helpful for me personally because he sort of helped me craft my TED talk. And then when you give a TED talk, uh, the TED organization also provides some speech coaching sort of help but that's more uh at the conference like basically in the couple days before the talk you know there was somebody for me to talk to to get help and then of course i read the books about how to give a ted talk and things like that are there books on how to give a yeah TED talk yeah the guy that founded ted basically wrote a book you okay know? <laughs> which is which is not not shocking yeah and so i don't know if it's fair to call that taking courses you know what i mean basically there have been at least two or three days in my life where i've received help for at least an hour to two hours <laughs> yeah so <laughs> The, the extent of my coaching probably sums up to three or four hours. What are two or three things that stand out to you from the, either the book? The things or, I've learned from? Yeah. Uh, you mean from the those types of courses and stuff? Yeah. Well, the, I think the most useful things for me were the basics, which are stand still on stage, have good posture, project, look people in the eye, speak to people. Your posture is much better than mine. Well, I'm, <laughs> yeah. well, you know, we're on video, so you got to look... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, an erect um, carriage, as they say. An erect carriage. Yeah. No, just like a you know, open chest. Right. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, the basics, like, don't pace, don't stutter, try not to say um and like too much. I mean, everybody knows those, but actually doing it is slightly harder. Yeah. Well, you've had lots of practice. Yeah. The main it, thing is, I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you feel. And so yeah. you're less inclined to fall onto those, to use those kinds of crutches. Right. I mean, I've seen that. Like, I've followed your climbing for a long time, and I've like yeah, seen. I'm I've more well-adjusted now. For yeah, sure. I've seen like the, sure. the evolution. It's it's actually been really fun to watch. Yeah. And you've done so many of these. It took me. I've been thinking about what to talk about with you for a long time. Like, how do we? It's hard want, to find new terrain. Exactly. Yeah. And I really want there to be new terrain. You're gonna for, you're for gonna your do some chassis link up in this in this chat. <laughs> you're like, well, everything's been covered. So I found this one bolt variation that link connects up. the worst two crags <laughs> or worst two roots of the crag. <laughs> like that's, that's exactly what's gonna happen here. Yeah. I have uh, I think I have three main topics that I'm most interested in with you. And then if you have anything that you wish you know, got asked more, things like that, stories that you'd love to tell. I'd love to hear about those as well. But you've teased this a couple times, I think on your pat podcast and then maybe in other interviews, but something I've heard you say a few times is there's these epic solos that you've done that have gotten tons of media coverage. And for whatever reason, those are the ones that everyone knows about and the media is latched onto. But I remember you saying like maybe there's a dozen that have been covered, but you've done like 30 mm -hmm. of those things. Tell me about the top two or three most epic solos you've done that nobody knows about. 
I mean, two obvious, uh, two uh, two different linkups come to mind. Actually, uh, one a while back in Zion, and then one uh, in Red Rock. But so, you know, free soloing Moonlight Butters is obviously one of the first big things I did, and sort of put me on the map and whatever else. Uh, I but finally then, tried the route. Oh yeah, and dude. It just hit on a completely different level. Oh, yeah? Did you find it kind of scary? Yeah. <laughs> well, I were just it's so insecure. Yeah. Like the 0.5 pitches. Oh, I find 0.5 is really secure. Let me see your hands. I've got really fat fingers. You do have really fat fingers. But okay. Of course, that means that the thinner pitches then are a bit harder. But, right. You know, it's all trade-offs. But I do feel really secure on 0.5s. Still. But, yeah. So I mean, yeah. So mind-blowing to be up there and think about well, that. Well, so... Yeah, so I worked the first time I did Moonlight. I worked it a few days, then sold it. It was like, oh, you know, big excitement. And then maybe four <laughs> years later or five years later, I came back with Tommy Caldwell and we did a free climbing link up where I think we did four hard routes in Zion in a day. And then the next week, I did a solo link up by myself, obviously, uh, that was three of those routes. So let's see, I did uh, Moonlight and then uh, Monkey Finger and then Shoon's Butters. So Monkey Finger is like a 10 pitch, 12B and shoes is i don't know like a 10 pitch 11 plus and those two routes i had soloed previously but um and those are actually both epic adventures as well because shoes i onsite soloed in a snowstorm and it was all pretty hardcore and then monkey <laughs> finger uh i also <clears throat> sold it actually monkey finger tommy and i climbed it and we wrapped it and then i sold it and then you know basically i'd climb the route twice before lunch it was kind of amazing <laughs> but uh but both of those when i'd sold them before uh, it was kind of in winter and there was tons of snow between the summit of the route and the rim of the canyon. And so I had these epic adventures doing, you know, something like 2000 feet of vertical of like extreme canyoneering adventure climbing through the snow to get to the actual rim. And then from Shoons, when you get to the rim, you pick up, I think it was like the Deer Mountain Trail, but it's like an eight mile walk back to the, to the valley floor. So when I did the solo link up, you know, it's like I did these three hard routes and then tons of hiking to connect them and to get back down off the top of uh, the, the rim in Zion. And I was like, it's pretty big. It's a big outing, you know, especially because <laughs> so I don't 30 think... 30 plus pitches of like 5.11 and 5.12 mostly. Yeah, mostly 5.11, 5.12 for sure. Wow. And yeah, I mean, and none of the three routes have ever been soloed by anybody else. And it's not, you know, it's, you, everything about it is like, oh, this is all kind of mega. But, you know, that's like an example of a, something that like I don't think anybody knows about. And it's just just a random thing. How does that feel for you? Like, was that? Oh, it was mega. I was like, this is so epic. It was insane. <laughs> yeah, it's like an amazing day in Zion. It was it was awesome. Just hiking around Zion that much is so beautiful. It's like, I mean, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. That experience, Tommy and I, because we had just climbed Moonlight a couple times the week before to do it for our link up. And when we climbed it, we simuled it in like a pitch. And <laughs> and okay. we... Uh, <clears throat> maybe two i don't i don't remember how it breaks up so how does that work you're just placing a piece like every 80 feet or something no no you just you just bring a bigger rack and you place gear as you need it okay but um and then we use micros and stuff to protect the second so the person below is always on top rope it all it basically feels like normal climbing you just never stop okay but when tommy and i did it moonlight felt much easier than i'd remember and i was like oh this is more like 12b like this is so chill and then i went back the next week without a rope and all the live backing with you when you don't have a rope on your feet are all a little higher you're pulling a little harder and i was suddenly quite a bit more pumped and i was like you know maybe 12c is appropriate i was like oh, i'm a lot more pumped but anyway yeah it's a great experience that's incredible i i can understand like obviously wanting to free solo all of those routes i mean i, I can't but like given what you've done that makes sense what what happens that makes you go okay what if i combined all these things and did them in a day no, I don't know. I mean, link up is just part of climbing. It's just just cool. more cool climbing. It's that Peter Croft thing, just like yeah, a little bit more of that. fun in a day. Yeah, I mean, thing is, when you solo a route like Moonlight or, or in any of those, it only takes an hour. So, you know, you have a twenty minute approach. You climb for an hour. What like a twenty five minute jog back down, and then you're sort of like, cool. Should we have brunch? Like, what do you do <laughs> the rest of your day? Like, obviously, you go climb other things. <laughs> like, that's amazing. What? So, um, when was that? I don't know. That was like 2012 or 2013 or I forget. It could have been 14, but it's yeah. been like 10 years basically. Yeah. And, and then and then just more recently, I did a similar link up in Red Rock uh, where I sold a cloud tower to the original route on the rainbow wall to Levitation 29. And then I attempted to solo Dogma on Mount Wilson. It would have been a nice quad thing doing all four. But, um, but after the first sort of bottom quarter of uh, Dogma, I was just not into it. So I down climbed and went home. <laughs> tell, <laughs> so, tell me about that. So what, what feeling did you have or what told you like, what was it that you noticed that made you think like, I'm just not into this. I'm going to reverse this. Uh, well, basically 
Well, the specific thing was that my fingers and toes were killing me uh, because I'd climbed levitation in full sun. Levitation 29 faces south and just bakes. So it's like a thousand feet of uh, climbing on dark rock and full sun in the middle of the afternoon. And it was hot and I basically burned. So my skin was trashed, my toes were hurting. And I'd already done 30 pitches up to 512. And so it's like, it's, yeah. you know, it's a big day. And uh, so then when I went over to Dogma, it was like getting into evening. I forget, I think I maybe would have had to climb into the dark. I forget, if, I mean, I'm sure I had a headlamp and I was ready for, you know, logging in for the night's sesh. But, um, but I was just like, this is all about to get mega. You know, I was like, I couldn't wait my feet because my toes hurt too much. I couldn't, I didn't feel like very secure on the holds because my skin was so soft and wet after, you know, 30 pitches of climbing in sun. And so I was just like, this is not the time to solo a big wall. Yeah. And then, also, I mean, and then there's the <clears throat> other side of it where it's like, uh, just by sheer coincidence, my wife's whole family was staying at the house and her Nana was there and they were having a big like cookout in the backyard. And it was like a whole thing. And I was kind of like, do I want to miss family dinner? And, <laughs> you know, I was like, either I'm about to have an epic through the night on something that's going to feel wildly insecure and be kind of messed up, or I can go home and have this lovely afternoon cookout with my family. And I was kind of like, you know, this is the time to bail. Yeah. But then you're always like, is that light duty? But then <laughs> is like, that whatever. light duty? That's so know. funny. <clears throat> you're the only person that could even asked that question, I think, was something like that. Mm. Um, I am curious about the foot pain thing. That's something I've always been curious about. I haven't heard you talk about that much, but every time you do one of these huge things, free soloing L cap, for, for instance, 30 pitches of continuous climbing, your shoes are on your feet for three plus hours. I know there's ledges and stuff, but- Yeah, I pop the shoes on and off, but- Yeah, like is, is foot pain an issue on stuff like foot that? Foot pain is- more an issue when you get beyond that. So I'd say for free sewing all cap, you don't think about foot pain. It's only a couple hours. You know, it's like perfectly broken in shoes. You pop them on and off. You're never in the sun. Where you really deal with foot pain is stuff like the L cap triple, where you climb L cap three times in a day. Because so like doing up. 90 pitches of crack That's climbing so in a crazy. day. And then with that, like when I climbed, to, when I did the L cap triple, the last route, we just climbed full afternoon sun, like blazing heat, like late June, or maybe it was July even. It was crazy. <laughs> on uh, lurking fear which faces west and just is, gets cooked in the sun and we were just dying and so i mean anytime you're in the sun it makes the foot stuff way worse your feet but, swell and yeah feet swell and the rubber the black shoe just burns your feet and then the rock is so hot anyway but um <laughs> yeah the main one of the things i always do with all these link ups is a uh, prophylactic ibuprofen like I just take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen every six hours, starting from the very beginning. <laughs> and what well, that does really help wow. up to a point. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and it helps with like the joint pain and the, just the various I. aches and pain. It just allows you to feel a little tighter on everything. Of course, uh, it only goes so far. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I think if you really cared, you'd have to switch <laughs> to a harder drug than ibuprofen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's probably some like algorithm there like too much of it and then you're loopy and it's probably not safe to no i just mean if you really cared you'd have to use like vicodin or something right but uh but then you know you don't want to do that yeah you don't want to be clear but i, I think vicodin. ibuprofen is actually the perfect way to take sort of the aches and pains edge off when you're just covering a ton of terrain and you get a little banged up and you hit things and your feet are swollen and your knuckles hurt and whatever you're like you know just take ibuprofen like candy <laughs> and and to be fair i only take i basically only take ibuprofen on big days like that no, I, I pretty much never take it normally because normally I wouldn't want to mask any symptoms. You know, like if your elbows are hurting, you want to know because you don't want to make them worse. Right. And so like in general, I never take pain meds. But if you're trying to do one of the hardest things of your life, like that's the appropriate time to take pain meds. Sure. <laughs> Especially because you just know it's going to hurt all day. Sure. And, and there's no need for it, basically. Man. But, what does your body feel like after something like that? Actually, generally pretty good because surprisingly endurance events... Uh, you know, you'll be kind of tired and maybe you want to take a nap, but you won't be sore. You know, if I did like a three hour moon board session, I'd almost certainly be more sore. Mm. You know, like intensity always sort of wrecks your body more than general endurance. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then this is backing up a little bit, but um, what was the one, what was the route in Zion that you soloed, onsite soloed in a snowstorm? Monkey? Uh, no, uh, Shun's Buttress. Shun's Buttress. Yeah, it's like a really classic 11 plus crack thing. Talk me through on-site free soloing because like rehearsing something head pointing getting it really dialed and knowing i feel comfortable doing this without a rope that i can kind of get behind that thought experiment it just makes sense but on-site soloing i mean is it okay I've, i'm not doing a single move that i know i can't reverse and i could climb all the way back down there's a little bit of that but there's also a little bit of just it's 11 plus crack you know like when's the last time i fell those. off an 11 plus crack um i mean 
to some extent, on-site soloing is like a test. You know, like you're basically, it's it's like your finals exam uh, at a certain style mm. or whatever else. And and particularly for classic routes, something like Shunes that people climb all the time, people love. It's you know, it's a great route. So you know that it's going to have chalk on it. It's going to be though. I, that particular time, I don't really know because it was kind of winter, so it wasn't <laughs> wasn't really wasn't really the season for it. But um, but at least you know that tons of other people have climbed it. It's not going to have loose rock. It's not you know. It's like the grade is well established. Like there shouldn't be too many surprises. Mm-hmm. And you're like you're just testing yourself against a classic. Mm-hmm. But I kind I kind of like onset soling. But you know, from time to time. I mean, actually, so talking about like unsung solos. I mean, uh, another thing in Red Rock, a friend, uh, Dave Alfrey, who's who's a fellow sort of you know semi professional climber, sort of big wall veteran, told me that I should definitely onsite solo Resolution Arret, which is like a 25 pitch 11 plus or something up one of the mountains in red rock and the 11 plus pitch is like a little finger crack out of roof and he was like it's super secure it's though i don't think he told me it was out of roof i think he was just like oh it's a finger crack but it's it's all uh sort of like yellows and reds aliens like it'll fit great like you'll love it it's super easy it's locker and i was like yeah cool i'll, I'll go up and on that's all this thing so i got up there and and then it turns out the crux is this crack going straight out this roof and you know you're 1500 feet off the ground or something. I was like, holy shit, like this is pretty scary. I was like, what? And then, and it wasn't really, it wasn't really that easy. And I, and to get up there had kind of been too easy almost. Uh, so I wasn't really warmed up. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, you're climbing like five, eight, five, nine, like alpine terrain. And then I think I did one pitch of 10 D, which was enough to sort of be like, oh, I don't really want to reverse it unless I have to, the kind of weird technical corner stuff. And then all of a sudden you're in this weird roof. And I was like, man, what a sandbag, you know? <laughs> like it's it's really rare that friends tell you you should onset solo something because typically friends right. don't encourage you to solo <laughs> at all. And so I was kind of like, ah, oh, it'll be great. And then I was like, this is not great. This is, this is messed up. But obviously it went, went fine in the went end. Fine. You, you know? survived. What is the hardest thing you've had to reverse down climb? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I must have down climbed at least 5.11 in my life. I mean, I've gone up and down sport pitches and things at different crags. I don't know. Oh, I've down climbed 12B sport. Um, but that was just because I went up it and then we went right back down it. Same route. Okay. Uh, things like that. Maybe there's harder. I don't know. But I'm trying to think of big walls. And then I've done a bunch of multi pitches, uh, like in uh, Petrero Chico in Mexico. I've had a few things where I climbed like a 15 pitch 10 D and then just down climbed it after. Wow. Uh, things that climb towers and stuff like that, where you're kind of like, Oh, I don't want to carry a rope and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do a couple hours of repelling by myself. Down. Yeah. You're yeah. just kind of like, oh, I'll just climb back down. <laughs> that we get double the pitches in the day. Nice. But, <clears throat> yeah. I have a couple more questions kind of staying on this theme. Why do some of these things get so much attention while others fly totally under the radar? What is that? Oh, I mean, if you don't post anything about it and there's no video or anything, then nobody knows, nobody, nobody cares. Knows. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel important for you to to share either of those two experiences that we that we talked about? Well, I think I I maybe you are posted here, something so. about Red Rock. I mean, I'll talk about it with anybody. I certainly talked to my friends about it. I was like, it was crazy. You should have been there, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah. But you just don't have to, or at least I personally don't have to sell everything. You know what I mean? Like, you know I mean? As a professional climber, you make a living from sharing stories about climbing and you know, whatever, selling your climbing in some way or another. But I just don't, I don't need to for all of it. You know, it's totally. like, no one's going to care. You know, no matter what I do in Red Rock and how hard it is, it's not free selling all cap. So mm. it's not going to like change my profile in one way or another. Have you noticed that shift? But, like people these days are kind of like, oh, he did another one. Well, even even 10 years ago, that was, you know, to some extent, like the, <laughs> the big link up we were just talking about in Zion, you know, it's like, nobody cares. Like, I don't think anyone knows that I've onsite sold at Shoons, like... And, and why would they, honestly, you know, it's not like groundbreaking in the way that, that, uh, moonlight was or the half dome was or whatever else. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's just funny though, because then you have something like Sendero Luminoso, a route that I stole out of Mexico that we made a fun little film about. And I love that, like that trailer, that like really slow motion clip with that, like really peaceful music. And it's like mm. panning over you. I was just it's like, beautiful footage. Yeah. That is so insane. It was yeah. so cool. Yeah. But so it's funny. So that one only got filmed because 
I needed a partner for it because the root had overgrown quite a bit. It like wasn't that popular and it was all covered in cactuses and stuff. And yeah, and cedars like scrubbing all the yeah, like stuff. Yeah, like we, you know, basically I'd gone up it with a, a normal climbing partner a day and we had spent a couple hours on the way down sort of cleaning a little and like prepping the root. But I knew that I needed like a week of effort to actually work on it and clean it and kind of buff it out. And that's kind of too much to ask a normal climbing partner. You know, it's like your buddy just doesn't want to work for a week. And so that was something where I knew that by making a film and doing it as like a North Face thing, then suddenly you have a built-in partner. You have a, you know, because my, my partner in that case, Cedar and Renan both came, filmed, helped, and it's all part of the process. Mm. But then, you know, but it was perfect because that way I got my trip to Mexico covered. You know, we rent a little car. We got tamales every night. It was a great trip. Everybody <laughs> had a good time. Yeah. And then, and sort of as a result, we made this cool little film. Mm. You're like... And so in that case, I sort of chose to make the film because I wanted to do this thing and I needed help and I needed a crew and whatever else. How often is it you pitching these things? Uh, you mean like for the films and stuff? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, in a way, it's always me pitching the thing because if I don't want someone to film it, then obviously I'll just do it by myself. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's always it's always my idea to some extent because it's not like anyone's ever telling me to go solo. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. That makes sense. Yep. But mostly though, I'm rarely like pitching them like, hey, I want you guys to, you know, because if nobody wants to shoot it, then I'll just go do it myself. That's fine. But there are certain things where it just makes sense to have help or things that where it's really easy to shoot. And so you're kind of like, why not have somebody there? You know, it's like if it's if you can just like park and get a long shot from the car, you're kind of like, you know, why not tell your buddy who can get some like rad shot of you doing a thing while you're doing it? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's always a bit of a balance like that where you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to do this thing and it's easy to, for someone to shoot it. Like, why not tell someone? Mm, yeah. Unless you're like, you know, I don't want anybody there because this, you know, means a lot to me or it's going to be really scary. Or I'm not sure if I want to do it and I don't want the pressure. And, mm. you know, then then you just don't. Yeah. That makes sense. Just depends. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on where the, where the limit of free soloing is. Um, because you are the person that's blown everybody's minds and totally changed what we all thought the limit was. Um, I was hanging out with Boone Speed this last week up in Salt Lake, and he was telling me that there's been two moments in his climbing life where he just had like a total brain melt <laughs> moment. And one of them was you free soloing Moonlight Buttress. He was just like, I, like, that's funny. Wor no words. I'm like, understand. not El Cap, but Moonlight. <laughs> well, because by the time he did El Cap, had, he, it already, it, right, it changed his totally. paradigm. That's interesting. And, um, and what, the other what was one, his other moment? The other one was uh, Sharma doing, doing Super a Tweak. Oh, Super, not necessary. Yeah, it was super tweak, I think, because it was Boone spent like, I can't remember. He'd worked it for like years, years and then Chris just took a dump did on it. Did it, totally. it like second day, like yeah. almost did it in a day. Yeah, and classic. It was just like, yeah. yeah. That's um, classic. But anyway, so so with that, what is the most insane thing that you can imagine being possible with soloing that hasn't been done? Oh, I don't know. probably I mean, no one's going to solo like the Don Wall. Like, do you think no, anyone's no, ever going to solo like the Nose? Or is it a bigger, harder thing on El Cap? Or is it something totally different? No, I mean, some stuff in the mountains, obviously, like giant enchainments and things. I mean, like, uh, Sean soloing the, the reverse fits traverse is pretty insane. But that's just kind of different than free soloing. Sean Villanueva. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> just because of all the ice and, like, the... No, I don't, I don't, just, well, yeah, you know, it's a five-day thing. So he was, like, rope soloing and hauling a bag and... It's just a little different than being like my shoes and my chalk bag and I'm free soloing. You know, it's like he was basically out camping in this insane mountain traverse for five days Got by it. himself. So it's this incredible climbing achievement and it's an incredible experience, but it's just like a little bit, it's like a different category in a way. It's not like free. So like he probably, I'm sure he did some kind of scary moves, but in general, if anything was weird, he would just, you know, aid climb or use gear and use a rope, self play, do whatever he needed. Yeah. You know, it's like he had everything with him to like keep it comfortable, mm -hmm. but including a sleeping bag, you know, it's like, if, if he gets tired, he just camps, mm -hmm. you know? Um, no, but I think that there's a lot of potential in, in that, uh, area of soloing, you know, things like, like what Sean did. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's like big link ups in Yosemite. It's like, but that's a little played out. I mean, I mean, free soloing the triple would be an obvious thing, except the half dome doesn't go anymore because a big piece fell off. Yeah. Um, but somebody will figure something out up there and do it a different way. The triple being El Cap, Half Dome, and Mount Watkins. Yeah. Yeah. And El Cap is sort of 512 or 12 plus, depending how you do it. Or sorry, uh, El Cap is 12 plus for sure. Uh, Half Dome is 512 or 12 plus, and Watkins is sort of 13 minus-ish climbing. So they're they're all pretty hard walls to do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, Watkins has never been solid. And that's sort of an obvious like thing to do if somebody was motivated. It's just, it's just not quite as cool as, as half dome and El Cap. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I don't envy whoever the, the next like big soloist is because I've, I've done a lot of the obvious things to do. Right. And it's just so much less cool to do second ascents. <laughs> No, it is. It, it is. I mean, it is still really cool because when I was growing up, <clears throat> you know, I looked at what Peter Croft had done and I was like, man, if I could do the Rostrum and Astro Man, that would be the coolest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And to be fair, it was the coolest thing I'd ever done when I did those. Yeah. I was like, this is insane. And, you know, like I'm doing the same thing as Peter. I was so psyched. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure whoever repeats some of these other things that I've sold, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have the same experience. We're like, this is insane. I'm doing this insane thing. It's so yeah. cool. No, that, that is interesting though, that, um, it's, I mean, climbing's like that. It's just going to be harder. Everything's like that. It's just, it gets harder and harder to have quantum leaps where you have someone who does something that's so far beyond what's ever been done before in that, whatever totally. that category is. I mean, that's kind of the, the normal process for a sport as it matures. You know, it's like, if you're an NBA player, it's hard to just show up and shatter records. Mm-hmm. Cause you're like, there've been a lot of other really good NBA players at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, I don't know. Whereas in the, yeah, back in the day, it's a little easier to show up and be like, I'm the man. Yeah. You know, Tracks, maybe even like a better example, like track. World, yeah, world records are going <clears> to <throat> get broken, but by, you know, this much at yeah, that point. Yeah, incremental margins. Right. <clears throat> yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. The whole quest for the two hour marathon, it's like kind of being broken, is sort of broken. You're like, oh, it's right on the edge for a long time. Mm. Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, climbing, I mean, there's still tons and tons of room in climbing, but. But it feels like soloing is getting less popular, if anything, though, or that there are fewer people doing that kind of stuff. So I don't know. We'll see. Maybe it'll fall out of favor for a while. Mm. It'll never fall out of favor entirely, though, because there's always going to be some some punk kid who's like, you know, like, all my friends are comp climbers. Screw them. I'm going to go have an adventure, you know, mm. whatever. Right. Yeah. How do you feel about that for yourself personally? Like, do you feel deep contentment with what you've accomplished as far as El Cap and soloing and Yosemite and the, the, the new things, you know, breaking the nose record and all those sorts of things? Um, do you feel contentment there or is that never ending? Oh, no, I feel pretty content there. That's awesome. I mean, I've, that's yeah, really I, cool. I mean, I've I mean, basically done almost all the things I've ever wanted to do. Like, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, pretty, so cool. that's pretty legit. Yeah, yeah. that's incredibly, yeah. incredible. I mean, you legit. know, there are other aspects of climbing where I'm like, I'm still a terrible boulder. You know, I'm, I still can barely sport climb. You know, it's that like- That is, like, I, I, hear, I hear you. Well, you com- know what I mean? Compared to elite compared levels. To the top. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, I mean, I can barely do what some people warm up on, basically. And you're kind of like, oh, man. Okay. I mean, only a few people in the world, like, but, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, I personally know a lot of those people. And so then you're sort of like, <laughs> well, he can do it. How hard can it be? And you're like, man, it turns out it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know. It was like some kid, you know, <clears throat> warming up on your project. And you're kind of like, man, that's yeah. a really good kid. You're like, <laughs> found it. Yeah. You know, where I'm like, I've been, I've been climbing, uh, let's say I'm 36. So I've been climbing 27 years. And basically trying my hardest for 27 years. Yeah. And then you see some like 13 year old, you know, warm up on your project. And you're yeah. kind of like, man, how much harder do I need to try? You know, you're like, I put a lot of effort into this. And it's totally. still just like, not that good. I know. But, I, yeah, I'm, I haven't been climbing quite as long. I'm 33. I've been climbing for 15 years now. Sorry, when I was 18. And um, <clears throat> I, I have kind of had this thought, like I still have big goals for myself, mostly in bouldering and sport climbing. And I think by the time I do them, I don't, I don't, e- I don't even know if I will think they're cool anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like everything's just becoming like so watered totally. down because so many people are so strong. It's just like, damn, can't keep up with the 10 year old kids. Anymore. Yeah. I, I always thought that V12 represented really hard bouldering. Right. Probably because when I grew up, V12 was sort of like almost the edge, you know, right, like right, maybe right. V14 was the hardest and 12 seemed like 12, really hard. 13 and now you're like, like, man, when 17 is kind of the edge, like 12 really doesn't sound that hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, Jeez, oh, V12 sounds kind of dumb actually. <laughs> Um, you know, a, a mind blast moment for me was actually listening to an interview that you did with Tim Ferriss years ago. Mm, I'm a I huge fan that. of him. And um, you told a story about Chris Sharma, you trying Necessary Evil and then Chris Sharma yeah, it's a doing classic, Necessary yeah. Evil. Can, can you tell me about that? Can you tell the story again? And I have some, well, I, I, I want to elaborate it on. I, I forget what I said on Tim Ferriss, <laughs> but I mean, the, the nuts and bolts of it are that you know, Chris Sharma did Nessar Evil in his like second year of climbing or something. I mean, it, it was the hardest route in the country at the time. Is Was it his third year of climbing? Basically, Chris Sharma just started climbing, climbs Nessar Evil. It's the hardest route, or maybe the hardest done by an American. Maybe Just Do It had already been done. I don't know the exact history. 
but it was this incredible achievement in American climbing. You're like, cool, Chris, you know, he does it in a couple tries, like no biggie. And then, and he wanted to call it like, whatever, it doesn't matter. But it meant like a down, to, downgrade. No, no, he wanted to call it like, you know, turd burglar or something, like something totally <laughs> right. stupid or like, right, right, right. like the fart smuggler. Like, you know, it meant like nothing to him. He's just like, cool, I climbed this route. It was fun, moving on. Yeah. And, you know, and I've tried necessary on and off over the years. And, you know, I've basically been climbing and training my whole life and I still can't freaking climb necessary. And you're sort of like, man, after 20 plus years of effort, I'm still not as good as Chris Sharma was as a 14 year old who had just found this new sport. Yeah. And you're just kind of like confounded. <laughs> but there's, it just right. shows a certain level of natural talent, you know, right. he's, he's just really, really strong. Right. No, I, f I found it fascinating because I think it put talent into real perspective for me. And obviously like, we all have incredible opportunity to grow and develop as people, as athletes, all these things. I don't think anyone's like destined to not be a good climber. Um, but I, yeah, but like comparing you to him, more, I was just like, yeah. whoa, that's fascinating. Yeah. That's so yeah. crazy. I think that's something that a lot of people don't appreciate uh, or, you know, it's hard to see the contrasts there because I think, you know, if someone's a famous climber, you just assume that they're a really, really good climber. But the thing is everyone's given a different set of, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, some people have a lot of natural talents, others don't, some work really, really hard, you know. Like, I definitely don't have any of the talent that Chris does. But, you know, I was given a separate set of gifts, which is that one probably being like a real passion for climbing, like going out and doing it all the time, which then sort of allows me to get the, the mileage required to feel comfortable doing some of the scarier things that I've done. I mean, you know, it's like, there's just a whole, it's just a whole different path. But you're like, man, the path that he set off down, like, I couldn't take that path. It's just, it's it's totally closed off to me. You know, it's just way too hard. Like, I can't do any of the moves. <laughs> like, the stuff that he did as a kid, I still just can't do at all. Yeah. I'm like, oh, well. You know, it's like just different different strokes, different folks. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And to fill in a little context for people that don't know that route, Necessary Evil, uh, 14C, maybe hard 14C at uh, Virgin River Gorge. And uh, I believe it was the hardest route in the country at the time. I think Just Do It had been was it done. done afterward. I think it, I think Just Do It had been done, but I think Necessary was a little harder oh. and came a little later. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's my recollection. I'll fact check it after this episode. Point of podcast, you just throw stuff out there, and nobody even cares. Yeah, nobody totally. Checks, you know, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, I was going to save this for later, but that's a pretty good lead in. I mean, you you know diminish your sport climbing relative to the best in the world, which I, I get what you're saying, which is. Totally appropriate. But you've done, I mean, you've done so many 514s up to 9A, up to 14D. No, um, the 9A I've done is probably for 14C. It's, okay. it's the classic thing where you're like, oh yeah, I climbed 14D, but you're like, it's probably 14C. And then I've climbed <laughs> a couple of 14Cs, but you're like, yeah, but like with the knee bar, they're probably easier. You know, it's like, so that's kind of the bummer of a lot of my hard sport climbing is that when you really think about it, you're like, you know, it's probably not that hard, but, <laughs> but it's fine. But you are correct that I've done, I don't know, like 50 or 100 514s. And so right. I've done you know, I have a solid foundation at the grade for sure. What would it take for you to climb like 15A? I'd need stronger fingers. Basically, I need, I need more power. I need to be able to pull harder. I need to be able to do harder moves. So some combination of more strength and more power, <laughs> basically better in every way. <laughs> <laughs> do you think you would have to change? Because it seems like you train a lot and you're like very interested in it. Do you think you'd have to change your your habits? Like stop going out and having these like 30 pitch days to-, to Yeah, and actually I think the biggest change would that I would need uh, a little bit more consistent th consistency throughout my year. Um, like, so for example- You're always going on trips. And, yeah, so yeah, yeah. like this last year, this winter, I went to uh, Antarctica. Basically I went mountain climbing in the Southern Hemisphere for a month in the winter. And the month before that, I'd focus mostly on cardio and like snow adventures. I was still sport climbing a little and, you know, training and everything. But it's just hard to, you know, like Chris Sharma isn't climbing the highest peak in Antarctica. You know what I mean? It's like, that's just not true. Like Alex Megos probably can't even hike up a hill. Like his legs are so skinny that like he probably can, but he, but he chooses not to because it would be a waste of his energy. Right. And so I think that if I really want to devote myself to, to high performance, very hard climbing, you know, I'd have to rein in some of the other things that I do. Mm. Is that a goal? I mean, maybe a little, um, we'll see. I've, I mean, the thing is though, that that's been like a real tension in my climbing for the last 15 years, let's say, where it's like, I've always wanted to be stronger. I've always wanted to climb harder. But then the reality is that I get more satisfaction from the adventures and from the big outings and from the crazy experiences. And, yeah. um, 
And like going on expeditions around the world, it's like the life experience you get from doing trips in rural Africa and things like that. I mean, they kind of outweigh sending one more 14C or something. Mm. And so- That's cool. You know, I mean, in a lot of the expeditions that I've gone on, <clears throat> you know, that's gone a long way towards informing the work that I do through my foundation and, and the other sorts of things that I do in life. I'm kind of like, you know, I'd rather have a broad, rich life. Mm. I mean, I do want to send harder roots, but you know, at, at what cost? Yeah. But I am sort of seeing now as a dad, uh, basically being a dad lends itself more to the to the high performance sort of hard climbing, like a little more time at home, a little more time training um, and sort of fewer big adventures away from the, the house for a long time. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, you know, good time to try to climb harder routes. Tap into that dad strength. Yeah, and so far I haven't had any dad strength, but we'll see. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. It's just, you have to focus your time. Um, yeah, that, that it's it's crazy how many examples there are of that leading to like huge performance bumps for people that think that their climbing hard days are over. You know, all of a sudden they just level up in a big way because they have to focus with the limited time they have. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be like, if I decided to go back to university or something and suddenly just had a schedule for, for like I dropped out of college when, and I'm not going to, but, but say I suddenly had a structured program for the next four years where it's like, I'm going to be in one place for four years, only doing this thing and only taking two weeks of vacation a year. And then just stuck to a to a consistent, you know, hangboarding and, and sort of board climbing program. Like, yeah, I don't doubt that I would my bouldering would probably jump a couple grades and and in turn my sport climbing probably would too. Yeah. Uh you know, but would I die a little on the inside? Like, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> would you die just, on the inside? It's all it's all it's all trade off. <laughs> right. Totally. Um, I just had a thought, it just escaped me. What was I gonna say? Um What was I gonna say? I can't remember. Oh, do you have a wall here at your house? I have a hangboard inside my wife's closet, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I am hoping to build a sort of home garage setup. Nice, but we don't don't have anything yet. Okay, gotcha. I know it's kind of sad because the gyms in Vegas are really sad. What is the deal with that? Are there like really sad. building limitations? Is it like a height thing or something? Because no. you would think that Vegas would have like a mega gym by now. I know you would think. And I and I think maybe that some some companies are working on that kind of thing. Okay. But that's kind of always been the rumor for the last 10 years. Like someone's always trying to work on that and nothing's happened. Huh. I think part of it is that there are currently three sort of adequate gyms in Vegas. And so it's hard to come in to build, you know, it's weird. It's not like a totally open market. Right because there are already three gyms serving the Vegas area, mm -hmm. but they're all just very, you know, I mean, I'm personal friends with everybody involved in all the different gyms, so I don't be too disparaging, but right. you're kind of like, <clears throat> but they're all very- None of them uh, are modern mega gyms. Yeah, 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 yeah. There leaves a lot of room to it for improvement. Right. I mean, it's interesting though, because like how many gyms are there in Seattle? No, it's insane. There's probably 20. Or think of Salt Lake. Salt Lake has like 15 gyms and yeah. 15 are like the best gyms in the country. Yeah. Like insane gyms. Yeah. And you're like, what does Salt Lake have that Vegas doesn't? Vegas is a way what is better the, place. How's the population compare? Vegas is 2 million people. I don't know what Salt Lake is. Yeah. But, you know, I mean. Yeah. I mean, even like uh, the Someone, city that someone's I'm. Someone's got to do it. Someone's got to be. No, a so, somebody will for sure. Gym here. I mean, I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. But we'll see. No, I'm from Sacramento in California. That's also. 2 million plus people, maybe more now because I've been gone a long time, but, um, and it has three gyms and two of them are sort of like mega nice commercial, like really good facilities. And then third is sort of scrappier. The third is the one that I grew up in when I was a kid. It's so it's really old, but still it's like three good gyms. And you're like, you know, why is that not the case here? Mm. But whatever. Yeah. Soon, hopefully. Soon, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Either way, I'm going to build a home garage because I'm not I'm not <clears throat> nice. holding my breath for the commercial yeah. gym. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's such a like a um, like lucky thing to be able to do for anybody, but it's like so life changing. I had a home wall when I lived in Bend for a while. Just the convenience and being able to kind of dial things in for specific goals that you have and yeah, no, and it's, it's amazing. It's funny because I'm always a little like, oh, does it feel too bougie to like build my own home setup and wall and all that? Because you know you can just go to the gym and climb with everybody. But then I'm like. God damn it, I'm a professional climber. Like, <laughs> yeah. if I'm gonna do anything that's sort of self-indulgent, like that's the thing I should indulge in. Totally. You know, like it's not buying a Lamborghini, you know, it's like right. building a training apparatus. Like that's <laughs> that seems appropriate. Yeah, that does. That absolutely but. does. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, the next topic that I wanted to talk to you about, we've kind of touched on it. Um, I think there's a story here talking about the link up you did in Zion, but near misses. I read your book years ago. 
And I remember reading the chapter about you soloing a lot in Owens River Gorge back mm. in Bishop. Um, from what I recall, you were you were younger and it was hard to find partners. So a lot of your soloing was just born out of wanting to climb a lot and like not wanting to like meet strangers to go climb with. Um, and I remember one specific story you, you would have to, because it's Owens River Gorge, you can't like top out a lot of these routes. You would go up and you'd have to down climb all these things. And you were coming down like a 10B or something and you were like maybe 20 feet off the ground, just kind of coming down nice and smooth, <clears throat> 10 or 15 feet up and you slipped off and like fell and hit the ground. Yeah, but probably, <laughs> but I probably fell from six feet off the ground or like five. Oh, okay. basically it was like smaller than a bouldering fall. Okay. Which a couple of those like, you know, falls while soloing are kind of more like, you know, you solo a route and then when you're down climbing the route as you start to get to the bottom, it starts to be like playful where you're like swinging around on jugs and having a good time and like the way you went on boulders and then you basically slip off the bottom moves. And then you're like, whoa. And you're like, yeah, you did fall off and it was unexpected, but it's only because you were only a few feet off the ground. So okay. you knew that you can kind of loosen up. Okay. You know, so um, it's like, I mean, I personally don't think of those as near misses as like, like I've had a, like a, re well, I've had a lot of like much more near misses, <laughs> but the thing is, is that they never really happen. So you never know how near it actually is. You know, it's like a hold breaks or right? like, a, you know, down climbing a route in Chad once in, in Central Africa. I was down climbing some virgin choss on this tower that never been climbed and both my footholds broke off and I was just left like hanging from this jug and you're kind of like, huh, you know, it's all these like mud plate things and, you know, things like that. But you're like, is that a near miss? I mean, I felt secure on the thing. It's easy climbing. It's fine. But you're like, yeah, I mean, both your feet broke off. It's like mission impossible stuff. You're just hanging there being like, whoa. <laughs> and so, I mean, there've been a lot of things like that, but, yeah. but it's not like that keeps me up at night being like that time, that thing almost happened. You're like, to some extent that stuff just, you know, it just happens. Right. That's interesting. I, I mean, I was kind of imagining that's what I wanted to ask next, like broken holds, I don't know, bugs flying yeah, out of birds. cracks. I've been birds attacked birds by ravens a bunch of times. I've been attacked yeah. by ravens, okay. Well, like when they have nests, they, they're like not... I mean, <laughs> they like they, dive bomb you and try Yeah, to they didn't do physical harm you. to me, but it's really scary. <laughs> they're yeah. like big birds getting really close and you're like on small holds. People are like, oh my God. <laughs> it's pretty, it's kind of mega. Do you have, what is the closest call you've ever had? Oh, I don't know. I mean, the... Uh, I mean, those things, you never really know how close it is. I mean, I've had things where like, I pulled a huge flake off. Uh, Royal Arch is actually a really easy route in Yosemite. Like I was probably in my in my 10s. I was probably soloing an approach. who's just like romping up this classic. But I pulled a huge flake off and, you know, sort of started to go backward a little bit and then sort of shoved the flake back into place and caught my balance. And like the rock stayed in place. I stayed in place. Everything was fine. But you're sort of like, whoa, like that's like that was scary you know yeah. you're like oh geez but you never know how close those kinds of things are right you know it's like i don't know i mean there are a lot of a lot of things like that over the years but to be fair there are a lot of things like that while hiking and stuff as well right you know like approaching cliffs and like scrambling into weird positions or like, like stumble at the edge of a cliff yeah or, like, or like your balance or something yeah trying to find the tops of random crags or even just like while trail running you know you just trip over some freaking rock and just eat it into the ground and you're like damn it you know, yeah. it's like i mean basically if you're adventuring outdoors all the time things happen right you know like you get stung by a bee in an opportune time or whatever it's like it's just part of being outside all the time have you been stung while soloing actually i don't think so i feel like i'd remember knock, knock on wood yeah yeah <laughs> that would yeah. suck but i've definitely uh <clears throat> like i was doing a sort of scary run out trad face sort of thing in yosemite and the wall was like covered in wasps or like bee things basically i was like trying to time my climbing to like the swarm of stuff around me. And I don't think I want to get stung, but it, you know, it's obviously really scary. Yeah. You know, I mean, plenty of stuff like that. Damn. Yeah. I, yeah. I see what you mean. I mean, I don't, I don't solo. Um, but I think one well, of maybe the, you should, <laughs> maybe I should Let's give it a try. One of the, uh, It'll nearest really tank your sport climbing. <laughs> <laughs> one of like the nearest misses I've had personally was, uh, I was just like bouldering up in upper chaos in Rocky Mountain National Park. And I was like projecting this thing and spending lots of time up there over the summer, a couple summers ago. And I was like, you know, I was, it was just one day of many and I was hiking up a talus field with three crash pads on my back. <laughs> and I like almost lost my balance and fell off a talus block. And it like, it would have been awful, mm. you know? Like it was a really jumbly, sharp, heinous landing, like 15 feet block that I was standing on or something. And totally, yeah, something like that happens and you're just all the adrenaline and you're like, don't like, don't lose respect died. for what I'm doing yeah. right now. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What is um what does the debrief look like 
when something like that happens? Do you just kind of compartmental, car, compartmentalize it away or do you sit and like reflect yeah, on well, that? The, or? The, the interesting thing with near miss experiences is that by the time you can process the fact that something happened, it's already in the past. And so there's nothing really to be afraid about now because like the thing already happened. Yeah. So typically with soloing, if something goes sideways, like something unexpected occurs, you know, you sort of just have to like, well, that happened, but it's done. And I'm still just focused on what I'm doing now. I think that the time when when that matters the most is if it changes your, uh, you know, if it makes you reevaluate, reevaluate the rock quality, let's say, or reevaluate, you know, whether or not you're on route or, you know, basically if like you've just received new information that you should use in some way. You in know, that like, moment. Yeah, because if you're climbing something and you're like, this is classic, I can just reef on every jug. People do this all the time. And then the first jug you grab rips off the wall. You're like, time to reevaluate all of my preconceptions yeah. and treat this totally differently. Yeah. And so, I don't know. Have you ever, do you know Reglos in Spain? Reglos? Yeah. No. It's um, it's a multi-pitch conglomerate climbing area. So it's like river rocks. It's like a river rocks in a matrix. It's kind of like Maple Canyon in the US. Okay. But so it's like big cobblestone uh, things sticking out of like a sort of sandstone matrix. And uh, it's pretty cool. But uh, there's a classic group there called Fiesta de los Biceps. Uh, it's like a, I don't know, probably like seven to 10 pitch, 11 D. And super famous, super classic. Like from the parking lot, you can see this line of chalk going up this tower because like people climb it all the time. So I was in Spain on a sport climbing holiday, basically, and uh, and went to Reglos one day and I on site soloed Fiesta de los Biceps. It was like a fun, you know, I was like, it's the best route there. It's classic. It's kind of in the great grade range. And I was kind of like, you know, 11D jugs like should be freaking fine for me. But I was on site, so it turns out that the crux is like not jugs, and it was all kind of scary. <laughs> and that is actually a route where I got attacked by birds uh, higher on the route. But the thing is that the jugs were so big that I was kind of afraid to pull on them because it's giant cobblestone sticking straight out of the wall. Mm. And, you know, the whole cobble is covered in chalk, but I was kind of grabbing just the very back of the cobbles with just a couple fingers because I really didn't want the leverage of just pulling straight out on some big hold. Wow. You know, so it's pretty scary with the... And then actually the other thing with Fiesta is that uh, it's kind of overhanging for several pitches in a row. I've, it's been a long time and I'd have to look at the toe, but I don't want to misspeak, but you know, it's like say four or five pitches of like overhanging jugs that are kind of like 11 B or 11 C jugs for many pitches. But you start to get pretty pumped if you never stop to belay mm -hmm. and you never like sit down or anything in the middle of it. And so by the end, and then I wasn't really grabbing the holds that well because I, I was afraid to pull them out of the wall. You're making it and harder. So, yeah. And so by the time I got to the top, I was like, I'm pretty damn pumped. <laughs> I was like, this is, it all turned out being a little more of a thing than I expected. We were just like, oh, this is a lot. But the point being is that when you solo, you often worry about rock quality more, worry, you, you know, you basically take other steps to try to stay safe. Right. But yeah, of course, if you really want to stay safe, you wouldn't go on site. So <laughs> fiesta, but, but it was an amazing right. experience. Nice. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, so back to Zion. Um, I was actually, I was hanging out in Waco tanks, uh, this winter. Ethan Pringle was there for a while. Oh, we were cool. having dinner one How's night. How's he doing? He's, he's doing pretty well. I haven't seen him in a long time. His, uh, I think his shoulder's been bugging him for a while. We're actually oh. going to go to Rocklands together this summer. So cool. I'm, I'm psyched to spend some time cool, with him. Cool, cool. You know, um, he, uh. Have you ever, he, we competed as kids. He beat me at every comp I ever did as a kid. <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> he's, he's a year nice. younger than me, I think, but he's always been way better than me. But <laughs> I always remember his parents being like, oh, really good effort today. You really tried your best. You know, like, That's hilarious. Like, good, good job today. That's you know? perfect. But yeah. <laughs> we were, I don't remember how this came up, but we were using uh, chat GPT. Have you mm, played with yeah, that at yeah. all? And we were, I was like using it to like outsource interviews. I was like, what should I ask this climber in mm. a podcast interview just to see was, what it was. Was it helpful? It was like it... kind of generic, but like, wow, those are actually decent mm. questions coming from a robot, you know? Yeah. It's not a bad way to do some pre, pre-interview prep. Totally. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah I, I should think about that. <laughs> so I think I typed in like, what, what should a podcast host ask on Alex Honnold in a podcast interview mm. about his rock climbing, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but I asked Ethan what he would want me to talk to you about if we ever did an interview. And he mentioned, uh, I think it was that link up you did in Zion. And I, I remember, I vaguely remember this. I think you like maybe posted about it on Instagram or something. And it was the one where you topped out through lots of snow, like navigating, mm -hmm. getting off the routes was like really snowy and kind of mm -hmm. epic. You like slipped on the snow and like a bush saved you or uh, something. Yeah. Can you tell that story? Yeah. Yeah. They're two crazy stories. So the one you're talking about is from uh, above Shoon's buttress. So Shoon's you normally climb and then repel with two ropes. 
um, I soloed, so I got to the top of this little tower. This is then, when you on-site soloed it? Yeah. In the snowstorm? Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, it only started snowing on the last pitch. The forecast has shown snow midday, and I was like, oh, it'll only take an hour, it'll be fine. And then it started snowing a little on the last pitch, and I was kind of like, oh, better climb faster. And then by the time I topped out, it was like snowing, and I was <laughs> like, this is all pretty mega. Anyway, uh, I thought I was just going to scramble up to the rim. Turns out that you know, it's something that nobody, like probably nobody has ever done because it's pretty extreme terrain and like big terrain, like huge gash canyon things and like, you know, 2000 feet of vertical. And it's like this giant, I mean, no next one's ever topped like, it out because they all just repel. Yeah, exactly. Got you. Wow. I mean, maybe, maybe somebody has, but yeah. it would be, it would be mega, you know, and I was going up there like having just onside free solo at 11 plus been like, I'm freaking sending it's on, it's game time. And yeah. I was like, this is really real. So I kind of well, think- What was the, it? Like fifth class? What, what can you yeah, describe Yeah, well, it was more like a, like ball bearing hail, uh, <laughs> like unconsolidated hail on steep, like sort of fourth class slabs. Oof, so it was wow. kind of like, you know, tricky climbing-ish terrain, with lots of hail that was already there. And then, you know, the snow around me was just sort of like fun ambiance. Like it's snowing, it's pretty, whatever. <laughs> but then there was also a lot of snow because it's winter. So I'm like post holing up these steep technical slabs. Anyway, long story short, the, the feature that I was trying to climb was like this huge wall. And I was on this kind of ledge system and there was like a cliff band above me. And the cliff band, as, as I like progressed further up, the cliff band was getting smaller. But then the ledge that I was on was also getting smaller and like forcing me into like a drop off to the abyss sort of thing, like a 2000 foot chasm of doom. And so <laughs> I was trying to find the sweet spot where, you know, if I traverse the ledge far enough, then the thing above me becomes small enough that I can sort of solo this wall to like get onto the next tier of the mountain. Uh, whereas, you know, if I stay at a part where the ledge is big enough, then the wall above is too big. You know, it's just a weird trade off. Anyway, I found a good spot. I was like, okay, this is my thing. And I started to like solo this little face and basically broke a hole and just fell off the face and then just landed on this tree. And so I just totally stuck it, you know, it was just like under 10 foot fall, just like land stuck was like, whoa, you know, because the thing that I landed on sort of like rolled off into the abyss for, you know, thousands of feet. <laughs> And so it was all very adventurous. Yeah. <laughs> it was all very adventurous. Yeah, I was like, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? You, what do you mean you like stuck the tree? What can you well, describe? I just freaking it? fell and I just like land. I mean, so there's this tiny ledge and there's like a tree on the edge of it or something that. Yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, I didn't like grab the tree. I just have, I mean, maybe if there wasn't a tree there, I would have just landed either way. But, um, but I just, I just landed. I was like, holy shit. You know, I was like, geez, probably could have grabbed the tree though. Had I started to fall off. I don't know. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there are a lot of things like that. And the thing about it is that I was like, that's really scary. And then I just had to climb the exact same thing again, but just hope that nothing broke because you know, there's nowhere else to go. You know, there was no right. other way to do it. And so not like, like this is totally virgin, unclimbed. Yeah, yeah. This is like solo. This is, this is like what people imagine soloing in the mountains is like, yeah. you know, just like full crazy, you know, like the most rugged looking mountain you can imagine that's covered in snow with big chasms and you're just up there like figuring shit out. Damn. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you don't really get credit for when you're like, oh, I sold this route. You know, <laughs> and people are like, oh, yeah, cool, you sold that route. You're like, but then I spent three hours like fighting for my life trying to get to the top of the mountain Damn. to then hike down. Yeah. And then even once I got to the plateau, there was snow everywhere and I was kind of worried that I wouldn't even find the trail. Mm. And so, then, you know, I was like, I'm just gonna be wandering around up here on like the rim of Zion for hours, like lost in the snow. <laughs> but then thankfully I found the trail and it was, it was fun. Yeah. You said there was two stories? Yeah, so the other story, so I had just had that experience and then the next week I sold a uh, monkey finger, which is like this, I don't know, 10 pitch 12B. And that one, you know, I was sort of fresh off my survival experience on, on shoes. And that one was just like maybe even snowier. And same thing, you have to do like a thousand or 2000 feet of vert to get to the rim. And I was kind of like post holing in the snow, sort of confused as to where to go. And it was all sort of full on. And then uh, I found a freaking set of bighorn tracks and wound up following this set of bighorn tracks all the way to the rim. And it was the, it was like kind of this magical experience for me because, you know, well, honestly, I was like, this is how Native American folks wound up with like spirit animals and things like mm. that because it definitely felt like I was being guided because it all felt like pretty raw. I was like, this is scary. I just did something scary. This is all hard. I don't know what to do. I'm totally hosed. And then you find one set of tracks in the snow and you're like, well, must be going to the rim because I was basically on a cliff side. So it's like, it's not going anywhere else. You know, it's like this big horn was clearly going back to like where there's flat ground and yeah, just like guided me to the top basically. Wow. I was like, that's freaking cool. That's incredible. Yeah, I was like, What would your spirit animal be? I don't know, like a sloth. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly I climb. <laughs> well, I'm so mellow. let's talk about that actually, because 
<clears throat> you you solo these 10 pitch routes you're like this will take an hour um that's so much faster than than anyone else is climbing these big multi-pitch routes but that's not because i'm climbing right. fast that's because everybody else has just to like place a bunch of nuts and stuff right it's just efficiency yeah. it's just slow yeah. and steady you just never yeah. stop moving sort of thing yeah i mean i don't know if you saw the film with the no speed record but that's the, like that's the premier speed record in climbing you know climbing the nose in under two hours yeah and when you watch it, it like we're not actually climbing that fast you know, we never stop and it's super efficient and it's the strategy is very streamlined and very well executed. But the climbing, you know, is pretty normal. Like we're just climbing. There are a few places where you actually move fast on the very easiest terrain, but in general, you're just climbing. Mm. It's nothing crazy. Yeah. Actually, you want to, <laughs> this is a, uh, a fun aside for, you know, yeah. for all the listeners at home. <clears throat> so um, I wrote up an article for the American Alpine Journal when we did the nose and uh, I was writing it on a plane and I, it, for my wrap up at the end, I was sort of like, oh, I'm sort of curious. So I did a little back of the envelope math on uh, the world basically pacing. So for a hundred meter sprint, uh, what pace they're going versus a two hour marathon. Like mm. these are sort of the physiological limits for human potential, like doing a two hour or a two hour marathon or a uh, you know nine second hundred meter dash like that's what Olympic performance is yeah and so that means that marathon pace is basically half of what sprinting pace is okay this is all very like back of the envelope I'm just on a plane like thinking this through yeah so then I was like for speed climbing uh, say Olympic speed climbing they're doing a 15 meter wall in five seconds and so then I was like if you go at half that pace because you're climbing a big wall yeah how long do you think it would take to climb El Cap if you went at half the uh uh, t take a guess. I have no idea. Uh, an hour. 12 minutes. <laughs> 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And so my wrap up was kind of like, obviously we're not too close to the physiological limits of, of human potential. You know, it's like, yeah. And I mean, and even if you compared it to something, I mean, the more apt comparison would be uh, the vertical K, which is like an ultra running event, like running okay. a, a thousand meters of vertical straight uphill. Right. Because, and the vertical K is like roughly half an hour. And so clearly a human isn't capable of going up a thousand meter wall like El Cap faster than 30 minutes. Because like, if you can't trail run a hillside faster than that, then you obviously you can't rock climb a crack faster right. than that. Right. But it does kind of show that the physiological limits of human performance on the no speed record are probably closer to an hour and a half or like an hour 10 or, mm. you know, who knows if somebody was willing to try enough times and whatever. Risk their lives potentially. Well, yeah, yeah, it would be insane. Yeah. But what is the record for jugging ropes up El Cap? I don't know, but I would suspect like half an hour or something. Yeah, I, f I feel like yeah, I... Yeah, there must be, because the cavers set up this free hanging line and they right. jug the Don wall basically a, every year. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a thing. It's competition. I feel like it's like 45 minutes. I could be misremembering. Yeah, I, I would suspect that's, that's... I remember reading, someone made the point that like, if that can be done, then like, you know... In theory, you can climb theory, the nose. In theory, you can that. climb the nose that fast or, yeah. or like close to it. There's more logistics, obviously, and more like sideways stuff going on. Yeah, um, but in some ways it's easier also. So it's hard to say mm. because there are parts of the nose where you're basically running up a ledge system. And it's obviously easier mm. to like walk on a ledge than it is to jug, jug a free hanging line. Yeah. Because jugging a free hanging line is pretty freaking hard. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> totally. Though they are using caving setup. So it's all more streamlined than what we think of as climbers. Okay. But still, yeah. But So you would think that like an hour, an hour and a half is like a reasonable, but we're not doing it. <laughs> I was going to say, so if someone breaks your speed record, would you go back? If somebody broke my speed record and did, uh, I think our speed record is 158.07 or something. If somebody broke it and did 157, I'd be like, yeah, of course I'll go back. I mean, we can do better than 158. <laughs> like that's that's fine. Yeah. But if somebody broke it and did 145, I'd be like, no, it's yours now. 145, okay. I think. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, we may, I mean, maybe we could have shaved 10 minutes off. It's hard to imagine because as you get closer to the limit like that, it's, uh, it's pretty freaking hard. Yeah. Like it gets hard to shave another minute or another couple minutes. But, it's crazy um, to me to think that like, you guys climbed the nose in a shorter amount of time than like my average podcast episode. Like that is incredible. Well, we really hustled, you know, you don't really hustle in your podcast. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's, that's fine. <clears throat> yeah. No, but that's, I mean, a lot of practice and everything. Yeah. How many times did you guys climb it and prep for that? Well, so I think Tommy and I, to do the sub two, I think the two of us climbed it together maybe 12 or 15 times, uh, spread over quite a while. He was doing his book tour for the push. Uh, so he was kind of coming and going and I was working on other things and whatever. Um, but that doesn't totally do it justice because I had previously held the record with Hans Florian and we had climbed it together, I don't know, you know, five or 10 times over the years. 
And then, of course, I've climbed the nose just with friends and as part of other link-ups and whatever else, I don't know, you know, at least another 10 or 20 times. So not that those are all practice for speed climbing, but right. it's like every time you climb it, you learn a little bit, you remember the moves, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I've definitely climbed the nose a lot. How much of it do you think you have, like, memorized, like, move by move? I think if I went, I mean, I haven't been on the nose in a couple of years. I'm sure if I went up it right now, I would know, you know, half of it. Yeah, I would I would probably remember most of the tricky parts. <clears throat> We're like, oh, this is the weird thing where you place that one cam and you pull on it and grab that bowl, you know, weird, weird things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I definitely remember a lot of it. Yeah, it's crazy to think. I love you that know? about climbing. I love like just the, the just the amount of weird information that we all have yeah. sitting in our brains. You know, you meet someone at the campfire and you're talking about like, the specific shape of a hold on a boulder halfway across the world or something. Yeah. And you like exactly. both can picture it. You're like, oh yeah. yeah, your index finger, like yeah, you really grab that bump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, <clears throat> and with the big stuff, you just there's so much to to know. I mean, for for speed climbing on the nose, it's almost an academic exercise as much of a, as much as a physical thing. Mm. Like memorizing the beta, memorizing the strategy, executing it correctly. It's just like, there's so much that goes into it. Mm. Yeah, I imagine. <clears throat> that kind of leads us in. I'm not gonna try to force the segue here. Yeah, I have one more topic yeah, yeah. That, I, uh, that I was really excited to talk to you about. <clears throat> um, at this point, you've been climbing long enough. You've inspired the next generation or, or you've just inspired so many people to, um, like Jordan Cannon doing big link ups in Yosemite, people like Emily Harrington doing cool stuff. I wanna hear about some of the biggest lessons you've learned from your climbing heroes. And I have three people that I've picked out, but if there's Let's any hear. others, I think it'd be really interesting. Uh, Tommy Caldwell, Jonathan Segrist, cause you guys sport climb together a lot. And then Peter Croft. Yeah, good choices. Though, though Peter is definitely has been an inspiration my whole life. And Tommy kind of has to, and then J-Star just feels a little bit more like a contemporary, you know, we're like friends, friends. Yeah. Like, I mean, he is super inspiring and he just sent like one of his hardest routes and having seen how much he put into it. And I mean, actually, I was, so. Yeah, he just sent Stoking the Fire for people listening. Pretty Yeah, sick. which is like a hard 15B. And you're like, it's pretty proud. But um, actually, so to sort of answer your question in a broad way, I would say that J-Star and Tommy, the thing that I've maybe gotten the most from both of them are basically uh, respecting their commitment to to hard work, you know, like the effort that they put into climbing and how much, how well they've done because of the effort they've put in. I mean, Peter, you know, I mean, Peter's inspiring in a whole different way. And especially now, I mean, I'm pretty good friends with Peter. Uh, now, I mean, we're both North East athletes. We hang out. We like, the last time I was in uh, Bishop, I was there for a day and I basically rallied him to go sport climbing with me because uh, the Owens River Gorge, which is his favorite crag, his home crag. He goes there four or five days a week, basically. With, even on the days that he's not climbing, he goes with his dog to like hang out and just like walk around in the gorge. And and actually, I'd say that's one of the things that I'm really inspired about, uh, that, that really inspires me by Peter, is just his lifelong commitment to climbing. Mm. You know, it's like, he may not be doing the craziest things he's ever done. He may not, may not be, you know, like setting records, but he's still just out every day. He loves it. He does it. He's still putting up new roots. He's still like, you know, he basically he's still sort of puttering along, like doing the thing that he loves to do all the time. Yeah. I'm like, that's so awesome. And like that, that'll almost certainly be me someday. Mm. Cause I just like love going to the crag. Like I love climbing pitches. Totally. But yeah, so I'd say, you know, from Tommy and from J star, that, that sort of commitment to excellence, the hard work, the dedication, you know, I'm inspired by, by what they put into it. And then from, from Peter, I'm probably most inspired by just, his whole life around climbing, mm. you know, that climbing has been at the core of his life is for his whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just so like when he talks about some new route that he did, he still just lights up. He looks like a little kid. He's got this yeah. huge smile and he's <clears throat> so psyched. And you're just like, man, I hope I have even a fraction of that passion in anything my whole life. Totally. You know, totally. he's so into it. Yeah. But, I interviewed him. He was, uh, he was one of my early interviews, like number 10 or 11 or something. And, um, he like forgot we were recording. He was like holding the mic and his hands were doing this. And he yeah, was he's just, all fired up. Yeah, he's, he's all fired up. Just he's like, this is sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You I see mean, that gleam in his eyes. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, he's like, he's, he's all like wrinkly now. And you're like, it's because he smiled so much your whole life, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. And probably because he spent his whole life outside in the mountains. Totally. Yeah. But, he's so, he's got that like amazing weathered yeah. look. I want that someday for yeah. sure. 
<laughs> yeah, but then you need to climb more mountains and fewer boulders. It's true. <clears throat> or only boulder in, in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. Yeah. <laughs> if totally. you're at altitude, you're just getting worked by the yeah. sun if your I, whole life. If I uh, do end up looking like Peter, it will be because, because of I Rocky spent Mountain a lot of time Park. in Rocky Mountain, not totally. because I got into climbing mountains. Yeah. Who else would make that list for you? Like climbers that I've been inspired by like that? Yeah. Oh, I'd say that I'd say that I sort of draw inspiration from almost anybody in the right ways. You know, I, I, I try not to put anybody on a pedestal where it's like this person is like an insane, you know, like, I mean, certainly when I was younger, I did that a little more like, you know, I sort of deified Peter Croft a little bit where you're like, he's the man, he's the Peter Croft. Yeah. But, you know, as I've gotten older and a little more mature and whatever else, you're just like. And you meet all, all these people. Yeah. And, and you wind up as personal friends with all these people. You're just kind of like, we're all human. We're all just doing the best we can. We're all just going climbing. But that's not to say that you can't pull, you know, nuggets of, oh, nuggets. You Thank know? you. Nuggets of inspiration or like fun little pearls of wisdom. Like you can't draw things from people that you meet. Yeah. And, and even if they aren't even the best climber, like, you know, or, or even if every other aspect of their life is a complete shit show, you know, there might be that one thing that you're like, man, you are so good at that though. Mm. You know, like... I mean, actually a good example, as soon as I said shit show, I just immediately thought of the whole Mellow crew. <laughs> I was like, no, but but I think that's actually a perfect example where like a bunch of the Mellow guys, you know, I mean, they're all the strongest boulders in the world. They're incredible climbers. They're very inspiring in a lot of ways. You're like, when you see the the excellence with which they climb, the the passion they have for it, like those kinds of things. I'm like, oh, that is definitely something for me to emulate in my climbing. I'm like, they are incredible would I want to lead their life? No, you know, it's like, I don't want that lifestyle. I don't even want to climb the things that they're climbing. You know, like half the time I'm like, that doesn't even look that cool. You're like, that's just, that looks heinous. You know, look, look how small the holds are, but right. you can still be inspired by how much effort they put into it and how, how well they, they climb. Mm. You know? I don't know. I went soloing with Sean Rapp too. And uh, you did. Yeah. He wanted to solo some things in Yosemite. Okay. That's cool. He was there working some, you know, futuristic project and, um, I don't know, maybe boulding like project. one of his, I yeah, see. yeah, bowling project. Yeah. And maybe one of his fingers was hurting a little and I don't know, he's like on a rest day and he just wanted to go solo something. So I did two days with him soloing different routes. And it was interesting because he doesn't really know how to crack climb. So, you know, we were trying to be selective about things that he could climb without having to jam too much. But, uh, but he's so good. He's such a good climber. Mm. He basically, taking him soloing like that was kind of, I basically have a open policy that anybody who can, has either climbed 515 or V15, I will take them so long anytime. <laughs> like basically there's a certain level at which like, like if you can climb that hard, like you're gonna be fine. Sure. On easy enough terrain. Like you can do a one arm on any of the holds that you're touching, like <laughs> you're gonna be fine. Yeah. You know, but climbing with Sean, it's like he had no history of, he had no background for that kind of thing. And he just looks so smooth and composed. He's just such a good climber. Mm. I was like, God, you are. I was like, this is next generation. That's cool. I was like, you are a great climber. That's cool to hear. Was, He's so cool. So chill. chill. I know he's, he's so chill. chill. I can see yeah. him being like halfway up a multi-pitch solo and just being like, nice. This is cool. You know, yeah. just, just I think he was a little nervous, maybe. Face. I think he was a little like, oh, this is this is a lot, you know, because we climbed uh, three different routes up to the top of uh, Yosemite Falls, basically, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. One of them I'd never done before. Uh, it's called Via Aqua. It's like next to the waterfall. It's it's pretty neat. And you top out basically at the at the guardrail for like tourists looking over the waterfall. So it's like this pretty cool position. And he climbed well the whole time, looked great, having a good time. But I was like, I think he was a little like, damn, this is crazy. You know, it's like, obviously he's climbing a freaking big wall and he's somebody. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was awesome. That's awesome. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I can actually like, I can more picture him topping out and being like, that was scary. And like, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And you're like, was yeah, it? Yeah. He looked really chill the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, understated that guy. That's awesome. But it's so exciting what's happening in bouldering right now. Like yeah, it's, it's crazy. crazy. Yeah. It's popping yeah. off. V17s are going down and Yeah. Yeah. Do you follow that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, I follow I'm I follow the news on uh, 88.nu like all the yeah. time. And then I'm not really on social that much, so I don't uh I don't see like all the first hand, you know, people posting and stuff, but I I would say I I'm pretty up on the news. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, I'm freaking paid to rock climb. I should have some sense of what's going on. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. And that, that I kind of hope to hold on to for, you know, basically my whole life, like some idea of mm. like what the hardest grades are and stuff. Yeah. And, and like who the, the talent is in climbing right now, like who, who's doing the cool stuff. Yeah. No. Who, um, who have you been most impressed by that most people don't know about? Oh, I mean, depends what you mean by most people. 
you know, if you mean like Americans on the West Coast, then, you know, there's like a whole slew of hard man British folks like, you know, Will Bossy, whatever, who just did uh, Burn of Dreams. Yeah. And then who's the other really strong um, uh, British guy? I'm blanking on his name right now. Aiden Roberts? Yeah. Aiden. Yeah, he's been on the show. Uh, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, Will Bossy's actually coming up. So. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you're, you're just getting the good guys. <laughs> That's trying to. Like, yeah. You try to only interview The people. Mellow Crew's so hard to pin down. Yeah, dude. Well, we tried, we interviewed him for uh, Climbing Gold. Okay. And, uh, it was supposed to be all four of them and uh, only two showed up and <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no idea. <laughs> yeah, it was classic. I was Perfect. like, dude, yeah. The four being, is that like Sean, Jimmy, Daniel, and Juliano? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And so we only wound up talking to, to Juliano and Daniel. Okay. But but it's funny because when Daniel is sort of the the elder statesman, the like mature, responsible one of the group, you're like, damn. <laughs> you know, because I mean, Daniel has actually, you know, matured. Like Daniel is, you know, sort of a, elder statesman of bouldering now for mm. which is hard to believe hard to imagine but you're like man he has been He's at been the highest level of bouldering time. for like 15 years or something yeah i mean he was like winning abs comps 15 years ago or more yeah daniel um, if by some chance you're listening to this you have an open invitation <laughs> to be on the podcast i've yeah. tried to reach he out was, to he him, was actually he's... he was really good too on on climbing gold nice I was, awesome. I was like <clears throat> I, I felt like i saw a lot of like you know personal growth or something i'm like oh daniel you're really like that's pretty, cool. It was pretty great. Let's talk about yeah. that. So Climbing Gold, the new season's coming out soon. Tell me a little bit about the new season. Are there, what's the topic or theme? Uh, I don't know what the theme officially is. I mean, we're exploring a handful of fun, different, I mean, I think in general in Climbing Gold, we're trying to sort of unearth some of the the great stories of climbing that may or may not have been been shared well enough. So, I mean, like last season, we did a deep dive in uh, like the Dope Lake story, the sort of... Uh, the drug smuggling plane crash. In that is like such a movie script story. What is a movie? I mean, you know, it's that's cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. but I mean, just the fact that yeah, it's it insane. actually it's happened insane. Yeah. is so nuts. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> no, it's, I mean, and that's the story that the deeper we got into it, the more insane it was. <laughs> You're like, and then what happened and who and why? And, you know, there's all these to go listen to that. weird yeah. conspiracy theories <laughs> around it. And a lot of the, and then a lot of the people involved are all just total kooks, you know, <laughs> they're like, or, or really the way to say it is that they're strong individuals that have lived their life on their own term. You know, you're like, wow, you are a, you are a character, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, there's some interesting characters. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the fun of climbing gold is to unearth those kinds of stories and share them in a, in a broad way. Yeah. How do you decide what to do? Is that like a team effort? Are those your ideas or? Yeah, it's a team effort. And, and I mean, of course it's limited a little bit by availability. It's like, can we find the person? Do we know their contact info? It's like, you know, are we available on the right days? And so you're always limited a little bit by who you can find and when. And um, cause I mean, we're not like investigative reporters, you know, we're not actually right. journalists, but you know, we're doing our best. <laughs> yeah. Having, having a good time. That's no, great. I love it. I love yeah. the show. Yeah. Who have been some of the people that have been the most fun or interesting for you personally to talk to on the show? Well, in our first season, we, we talked to a lot of the just obvious climbing legends. And so, you know, I personally was, was thrilled to talk to Peter Croft. I was thrilled to interview Lynn Hill. Uh, one of the ones that I really enjoy talking to, uh, that was sort of an unexpected delight was, uh, Joanne Ariosti, who's, mm. um, I think it was one of our first episodes, but she and her husband did a lot of the new rooting in Las Vegas, uh, in, in Red Rock. And so I've climbed tons of her roots and, and as it turns out, the roots that they've established wound up being most of the, most of the popular roots in Red Rock. So on any given weekend, you know, there are dozens of parties climbing routes that they put up over mm. the last 30 years and they're still out developing. And, and it's just so rare, especially in the seventies to have, you know, a lady developing 20 pitch routes. It, it was, it's just amazing. You know, I was like, Oh, you really took a different path. Mm. And the fact that they were putting up sort of new school, modern, like nice, well-protected, relatively comfortable routes, like way back in the day, like good for them. You know, there's a reason that all their roots are super popular because they d did a good job creating good roots. Mm -hmm. It was anyway, so it was a cool interview with her. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you think, how long do you think you'll keep doing Climbing Gold? Does this feel, uh, you must enjoy it. Yeah, it's fun talking to the people. I will say the scheduling and the time is like, I mean, Climbing Gold is definitely the most amount of time and effort of anything I do probably. Okay. <laughs> like when you compare, you know, I mean, because I, I probably make you know, a good portion of my living through corporate speaking and things like that, where you like show up at some event, you speak for an hour, you get paid an absurd amount, and then you go home. I'm sort of like climbing gold is the opposite where you interview tons and tons of people. It takes tons of time. It's like hours spread out all the time. It's like you constantly have a thing going on. You basically don't get paid anything for it. And really like, whoops, not paying you the, the big bucks. 
athletic well, greens and yeah exactly. yeah athletic greens yeah i mean they do um i mean obviously we have sponsors for the podcast and so this the podcast makes some money but the podcast also has you know producers and and mm-hmm. like a team and people working on it and so right. like everybody's making a living and so and and you know i'm getting paid from it too but just it's compared not one to, to one compared to like corporate yeah speaking, compared you know? to to <clears throat> the money that that i personally can make through other things you know anything in the climbing world is just like when some venture capital firm asks you to come down and give a talk about, you know, achieving your potential or whatever, you're like, dude, like, <laughs> like venture capital, like they pay, you know, like it's not, it's not freaking athletic greens. <laughs> right. That makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Like it's insane. And actually living in Vegas, I, I do a surprising amount of speaking on the strip because uh, mm. Vegas is a huge uh, sort of convention destination or, sure. or like sales kickoffs and like sales meetings and things like that. So a lot of industries have, you know, conventions where it's, I don't know. I've I've done stuff where it's like you wake up in the morning, you drive down to the strip, you speak to like five thousand people in some insane thing. You feel like Lady Gaga. It's like these giant convention spaces, and then you're home in time for lunch, and it's like insanely well paid. And you're just kind of like, that was so chill. You know, wow. it's like it's so easy compared <laughs> to like, I mean, like doing the dope leg interviews for for climbing gold. Uh, you know, bless their hearts, but interviewing stone masters online, it's like just not that easy. You know, every, every one of them is like, wait, so where's the button and what do you press now? Totally. Yeah. And so, you know, on your calendar, you have it scheduled from like noon to one or noon to two, you're going to do this talk. But realistically, it takes 25 minutes to like set things up. Sure. And then, you know, a lot of the people have a lot to say. <laughs> so pretty soon you're sort of like, okay, we've now been chatting three hours. Realistically, the climbing gold episodes, we, we edit quite a bit, you know, we're trying to tell a good story. And so, you can talk to somebody for two hours and you'll use like, you know, seven lines of the, of the, the material. And it's important, yeah. you know, it's like in, they add an important voice to the story, but you're like, man, it is a lot of time to get a few nuggets, you know, yeah. pearls of wisdom out of it. <clears throat> like, man. you can say nugget. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. I just, you just cut I'll all just my you, nuggets yeah, out. I'll just write you, I'll send you an invoice later. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, that was a lot of nuggets. Yeah, it's gold. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, would you guys ever put out uncut interviews? I feel like that would be like a great like Patreon thing or something for for climbing gold. I don't know. That would be a choice for the rest of the team. Yeah. I'm sort of like, I don't know, would it be cheesy? I'm like, maybe. You know, the thing is that normally we're interviewing people have sort of thematically though, like about specific ideas that tie into some episode that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So we rarely do a comprehensive interview of a guest where it's like, tell Got us it. about your childhood. How'd you get into climbing? Right. And so I think that some of the things that we, some of the interviews that we do, if standalone wouldn't be as interesting as, you know, it's not a deep dive into that person. It's asking them about one specific experience. Yeah. Could still be cool, but it's just a different format. Yeah. I don't know. You should talk to him about Patreon. Okay. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I'll, I'll talk to Lisey. <clears throat> okay. I, uh, this is fun. I have another, I have another topic. This was a bonus if we had enough time and, and we're having fun here. Um, big wall pooping stories. Mm. This has been a hit on the podcast so far. I've <clears> asked <throat> this of Jordan Cannon and Tommy Caldwell. Mm. Not to put you on, not to put pressure on you, but they both had great stories. I have, I have better for sure. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm curious about that story. Tommy might, Tommy worst, might have some insane. Best or worst big wall pooping stories. What have you got? Oh, well, I mean, it depends. L- let me hear some competition. I'll, I'll frame my, uh, like, <laughs> okay. what, what was Tommy's? I'm trying uh, to remember. I remember he was like, he was doing. Uh, I mean, because he's pooped on a wall so many times. Totally. Yeah. He was he doing something. I can't remember exactly what he was climbing. Maybe it was when he did his double and he was doing ma- um, the free rider after mm-hmm. doing Magic mm-hmm. Mushroom or something. But he uh, he didn't know that Dean Potter was doing <clears throat> some like link up variation that hadn't been done yet. So he like went over to the other side of this ledge and like pooped off this ledge thinking it was totally out of the way of everything mm. and it ended up being like right where Dean Potter like had to climb through on this like link up or whatever new route he was doing or new variation he was yeah, doing. Yeah, that would be the round table. That's on the free runner. That's yeah. classic. That's like had to like the very top like, of the right next to his, his poop. That's <laughs> classic. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. No, I have a bunch of uh, pooping while free soloing stories. Okay. Because nothing, nothing loosens you up like, like uh, soloing I to really bet. sort of... You know, you're like, oh, I kind of need to poop. You're like, this is really scary. Uh, I'm like, which I don't even know which one to start with. There are a bunch <laughs> of like extreme. I'm like, and the, there's a recent one that's maybe almost too embarrassing. Not embarrassing, but it's like a bit much. I'm like, is it for public consumption? I've told all my friends. I think it, it is. Insane. You think it is? I think it is. Okay, so here's a, here's a story. Uh, 
so this last fall, I was uh, working on the Hurt, the big Red Rock Traverse, Han's ultimate Red Rock Traverse, which actually, um, I think Real Rock is releasing a film of it in like next week or something, or I don't know when this airs. But so there should be a little like 30 minute film online with, okay. of like doing this Traverse. Uh-huh. But the but the Traverse was me doing all the peaks in Red Rock. I did like 14 classic degrees, blah, 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 whatever. So it's like giant day. But on this specific day, I was uh, just going up to do uh, Crimson Chrysalis. Actually, I was going to do the entire uh, entire entire Rainbow Mountain Massif through the night. So that's like Crimson Chrysalis over to the Rainbow Wall, up the Bird Hunter Buttress, across, and down Solar Side. It was like three classic routes up and over this mountain, summoning a couple different things. Big hiking. I thought it would take me about five hours of soloing into the dark. And I thought that when I did the whole traverse, I would get there at nighttime. So I'd intentionally hiked in from the exit of Red Rock, uh, sort of at near dark, intending to do it all in the dark. Uh, so it'd be more realistic for the ultimate traverse that I was working on. Anyway, uh, some context. I think I'd given myself Giardia earlier that season Oof. in Red Rock, uh, drinking untreated puddle water uh, because it was really hot. And there were a couple of days where I wound up doing much more than I expected. And, and you're hiking down these canyons. And there was a heavy monsoon last summer. So there was still some water in the canyons and places. And some of the puddles look good. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, but I had some things going on with my bowels, which whatever. Then more context, because there was a lot of water, there were, it was crazy mosquito year. So like at dawn and dusk, there were like crazy dense mosquitoes out, mm. which, which I didn't know existed in Red Rock. I'd never experienced it before. But so all that to say, so I ate dinner with my wife, hiked into the canyons at like sunset ish. It was hot. I was like, felt kind of gross. Cause you're hiking uphill really quickly in extreme heat, September in Vegas. I was dying. I got to crimson. It was like, Oh, I feel like I'm dying. Started you saw along this route, which is a, I don't know, like an eight or 10 pitch, eight plus, but it's like really hard actually. And it's like a blank face with no relief. Like there are no ledges, there's no anything. Mm. I was getting swarmed by mosquitoes the whole time, getting eaten alive. And basically two pitches from the summit, I was like, I'm gonna shit my pants. I was like, oh no, it's like very dire. No um, ledge, you're not standing on a ledge. No, no, there are no, like there aren't even ledges to pop your shoes or anything. It's oh, like, man. you're just on a blank face. Yeah. And um, and really like smooth varnished rock, small holes. You're sort of like, it's like a really blank face. And I was like, and it was getting dark, dark to the point where I needed a headlamp soon. And I was like, basically I'm racing for the summit, getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, about to shit my pants. And I was like, I hope I make it to the top before I have to pull out my headlamp. I mean, it's fine. I had a backpack on, I could pull out my headlamp and do all that stuff, but you would just be hanging there one handed while you fish for your light and whatever. I wanted to get to the top. Anyway, maybe the last pitch, I was like, I'm not making it to the top. I'm going to shoot my pants right now. I basically climbed the last pitch, climbing a few moves, basically like clamping to not shit myself. And then being like, if I move, well, I shit myself, like, this is all a disaster. <laughs> anyway, I wound up making like two or three emergency moves off route to this like kind of one-handed jug, pulled my pants down, took a shit down like the side of the route, off route, thankfully, kind of fine. All very watery, very disastrous, very Giardia, total, all bad news. And, you know, eaten alive by mosquitoes. It's dark. I'm just hanging one-handed took this disaster poop and then couldn't really do any cleanup because I, I mean, I had TP in my backpack, but you're kind of like, uh. <laughs> so I wound up climbing the rest of the route with my pants around my ankles. It just like, and then <laughs> made it to the top of the tower, uh, still with my pants off and then did my cleanup and like dealt with things. And you know, it all wound up kind of fine. But I was like, oh, <laughs> it's not like the one handed, like literally just hanging on the side of a cliff, one hand on a jug, like <laughs> taking a dump. And you're like, it was all, it's all been much. <sighs> I was very, it's very embarrassing. I was all sort of like, this is really sad. And so I almost bailed <laughs> for the day. because I was like, this is not, it was like, cause you go out so long hoping to have this heroic experience where like, I feel like a boss. And I was like, I feel like a little kid that just shit his <laughs> pants. I was like, this is really sad. So I almost bailed and went home, but then I was like, well, it's kind of even worse. And so I wound up finishing the whole outing and it, it wound up fine, but yeah, it was sad. Thank you for sharing. That. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just had to get it off my chest. You know? No, I've had a bunch of uh, like you know hanging on poops while soloing. Because <laughs> there are a lot of places where you're like there's no ledge for three pitches or something, and you're just kind of like, well, like it's time. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, Jordan wanted me to ask you about shit pudding and where you stop to poop on your solo of El Cap. Well, shit pudding is just when you poop on a rock and then you hurl the rock off. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> which is pretty, you know, it's like a shot put, but a shit put. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done that all over the world on different ledges, <laughs> different rocks. I mean, in general, that's a much better way because it leaves no impact for other climbers and it's cleaner and it's, and it's fine. You know, especially if you're in like the middle of nowhere and 
um, you know, it's fine. Yeah, don't 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 do this off your local popular multi yeah, pitch. Yeah, or don't do climb. this like at a normal sport cliff, or you know, it's it's like the the point is that it's better to hurl it into somewhere that no one will ever go if it's possible. Um, yeah, and then when I sold it all cap, yeah, I took an emergency dump sort of midway. Also, you did. But, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, they didn't include it in the movie surprisingly, <laughs> <laughs> but but that was sort of poor form. That I wound up just going down a chimney uh, uh, behind the spire, which is like not though i did go in a much better way because people do that occasionally when they're bivvied there which is kind of poor form but it's because typically if you're roped up and you're doing that you kind of stop at a certain spot and it winds up like landing Mm -hmm. i went like way lower and like way further in there and basically pooped into a spot where it's like gone okay um because you know because i was soloing anyway so you're just kind of like i think you get a pass while you're yeah and that when that was kind of the thing i was was like it's way better to just go if you like if you feel like you even might need to you should definitely go because you know when you have the crux of el cap above you you're sort of like you know this is the time yeah Um, aside from cutting out stopping to take a poop in the middle of your solo were there any amazing scenes or moments that got cut out from that film Oh, I don't know. I mean, it was two years of my life. It's like, there's so much. So much. But um, anything that you wish had gotten in there? No, that, no. That I mean, I out? would say that the movie far exceeded any hopes or dreams I had for it. Really? Oh, that's, yeah. It's so amazing. crazy. I got to watch it on IMAX and you're like, dude, it's a movie about me sending the route that I'm most proud of in my life probably on IMAX. You're like, that's fucking <laughs> that's cool. Sick. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, like the footage sick. of El Cap is insane. Yeah. It like looks amazing. Everything about it. You're like, this is so cool. Yeah. I remember my favorite part of that whole film, I think you're driving into Yosemite and it's like you monologuing about like the warrior spirit, the, oh, the warrior spirit. Yeah. That's good. That actually, that audio came from Morocco, um, which there's a brief clip of uh, the Morocco climbing in the film, but it wound up being mostly B-roll. And, uh, and then actually Jimmy has this new TV show and they, so they used a lot of the Morocco footage as an episode for this new TV show. Like I think it's Edge of the Unknown. But anyway, um, that whole Morocco thing, Tommy and I did this hard link up and then I sold this wall. And so I was there for three weeks, but while I was there, I was watching this show called Spartacus, uh, kind of like trashy, like violent, like nudity, you know, it's like gladiators fighting. Mm. And um, it was like four seasons of it or something. I think I watched like four seasons. Like we, we would just be sending all day and then I watched Spartacus and this dude's cutting each other apart and then it's all kind of hardcore. But, um, but so I was like, deeply into warrior you know basically i was like oh this is so crazy it's like blood sport and then i was like oh so long it's like modern blood sport in a way because like the whole entertainment factor you know where they're making a hollywood movie and basically the central tension of the film is like will he die mm. and you're like this is modern blood sport you know i was like this is like modern gladiator stuff anyway so i was like all rambling about that and then it all freaking made it in the movie and i was like this is a little embarrassing but <laughs> <laughs> like, that, was, that was fine <laughs> but that's the problem is that when someone's recording you for two years you get all kinds of crazy shit sure and then you never know how they're going to use it yeah well i yeah. i like kind of got uh well that's the thing a lot of people watching. well yeah a lot of people are really inspired by it and like that's so incredible and i'm always a little like oh i'm a little embarrassed <laughs> by it but, i mean but yeah. i agree that if i was watching it if i wasn't the one that said it, i'd be like oh this is so inspiring because yeah. like that's in the same way that you know i'm inspired watching Spartacus or whatever. Yeah. Like you can draw inspiration from anything if it's like strikes the right chord. Right. I mean, but, it was it was specifically, it wasn't about like the warrior part of it necessarily. It was, I think you saying no one ever did anything epic while sitting like comfy on the couch. Totally. You know, yeah, the just, commitment to excellence, like yes. try hard, do hard things. Yes. Yeah. Love yeah, that. totally. Yeah. Yeah. I'm my, my wife's always like, but do you need to, you know, it's like, like, why not be comfortable? Has that changed for you? Having being more comfy? Yeah, well, having like sent like the dream proj. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm probably, I'm definitely less hungry and like angstful about it. Yeah. I have less to prove. Um, But I would say I'm probably, I probably spend as many hours a week. No, that's probably not true. I probably spend a fewer hours each week working on my climbing as well. But part of that's just like having a kid and having a house and whatever. But um, no, I'd say I'm just as committed to climbing as ever but I'm just a little less angstful about it. And like, you know, yeah, yeah, it's hard to say. Do you have a goal right now? Yeah, well, I, hopefully I'm gonna send the sport project tomorrow. And what are then, you trying? Uh, uh, this new thing, somebody bolted, it's like a new Greg. Uh, it's funny, my friend and I were just trying it and uh, we both, we went back and forth on it, three burns each. And we each burn be like, okay, you know, we're gonna like link from the middle to the top, it's all good. 
I don't know, like somebody, the guy that bolted was like, maybe it's 13B. And then I tried and I was like, maybe it's 13C. And then we both got completely throttled, like a bunch of burns. And we're like, maybe it's 13D. And we're like, maybe it's, you know, basically we're just getting freaking worked. And it's it's kind of a weird route where like the holds are pretty good, but for whatever reason, we just like can't freaking climb it. Mm. And so and we're like, you know, maybe it's pretty hard. Like, we'll see. But hopefully I can manage it tomorrow. Right on. But that's not like a project. I mean, I've been yeah. trying it for a week Mini or crush. I've tried it a couple of days now, <clears throat> but um and then you know i tried something in the canyons there's like a new hard thing basically there's always like some stuff you know i always have a running list where it's like depending on the season depending on who's available yeah i'm doing a bunch of work travel the next couple of weeks so i'm trying to intentionally not get too committed to any project because the reality is i won't be able to go work on it yeah um so i'm mostly focused on like having good sessions in the gym and the various places for the next couple of weeks i think that's fine what's the next trip that you're really excited about actually well i don't even have like any big trips coming up um I think we're going to spend uh, June in the PNW, actually. Um, oh, nice. I think in Mazama. Might climb nice. a Washington Pass, which I'm kind of psyched about. Cool. Because uh, my wife's best friend's getting married. So uh, so we're going to be there anyway. And so I might spend a couple weeks there and try to do some of the hard multi-bitches there. Nice. So beautiful up there. I'm pretty psyched about that because it's just like a new, like a totally new area that I just haven't climbed in. So you try cool. Mikey and SJ's route on Liberty Bell? Yeah. So actually their older route, um, which I think... Did they maybe rebrand a servant to Liberty or? I'm not sure. I think it was called a slave to Liberty. And then they were like, oh, that's weird. So they uh, oh, okay. rebranded it. But um, I think that one, I think is the only thing I have climbed on Liberty Bell. And that was like one they put up five years ago or something. And it was like 13B or something. And then I think they now have a newer, harder one. And uh, yeah, I'd love to try it. The dark side of Liberty? Yeah, dark side of Liberty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's on the shadier face in the front mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, there are a bunch of hard multi pitches up there. I'm psyched to, we'll see what partners we have. But yeah, so, but that's not like a trip, you know, it's just going to a wedding and trying some hard things where you're there. Yeah. And then there are a couple potential things happen in the summer, depending, but it might be a TV thing. It might be, it's like, we'll just, we'll see how stuff shapes up and we'll see. But yeah, otherwise no big, uh, no big, no big things. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, honestly, I do a lot more work now. And so my year is not. And you have a child. Yeah, and I have a child and a wife and, things. you know, family and a bunch yeah. of other stuff. Yeah, other other <laughs> commitments and, and time constraints. But so I just don't have like a totally open calendar where it's like, and then maybe I'll go to Road AR for six weeks and try my project. It's like, no, it's way more like things have to fit on a calendar. And, right. You know, 10, 15 years ago, I was just living in the band by myself and you're kind of like, Oh, it got kind of warm. I'll just like go North for the next couple of months. I'm like, no, like that, <laughs> th those days are done, <laughs> but you know, they might return in a few more years, but yeah. Yeah. Do that with your family. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually. I mean, we just spent five weeks in France, uh, bouldering and font, which is amazing. Yeah. And I'm sort of like, you know, if I can have one or two things like that a year, like that's, that's, that's great. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. Was that just a fun trip? Like, did you have goals going into the trip or just trying to like enjoy a new area and doing lots of climbing? No, my main goal was to just not, not suck. <laughs> Which I was like, <laughs> okay. just try not to, yeah, try not to suck. But, I don't know. I was like, did I just hear a baby monitor? I think I did. I'm, I'm not, oh, it doesn't matter. I was like, I'm gonna unplug that in case uh, oh. people came back. There's a monitor on the floor right there. Okay, gotcha. We're almost done. Let's wrap up. Yeah, okay. Let's do it. What is something you wish people spent more time thinking about? Oh, I don't know. Like, like in general? Yeah, could be anything. Maybe like environmental stuff. You know, it's like, if you're going to choose one thing for everybody to think a little bit more about, it'd be like environmental impact and, and sort of like lifestyle choices. Like, do you need that thing? And like, will that thing actually give you joy? And like, is that, is that the important thing in your life? Mm. You know? Yeah, or like when you order food and stuff, it's like, would you intentionally choose to kill that creature? You know, it's like, because there are a lot of things that are done just sort of by default. Mm. And, you know, more intention never hurt. More intention never hurt. That's a nugget, right? Yeah, there. it's a nugget right there. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> well, nice, man. Um, you have the Honnold Foundation. Uh, where can people find you? Anything else? Do you, uh, What else do you have going on? Anything else you want people to know about before I let you go? I mean, I'm like, I think enough people have found me. Nobody needs to find me on anything. <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean, if anybody's interested, they can check out the Honnold Foundation.org. Uh, you know, check out the new season, Climbing Gold. 
uh i mean shizzle you know i have like a disney plus show coming out there's all kinds of like crazy shit what, like what is what it is doesn't that? freaking matter <laughs> it's like oh it's all like i don't think anyone's hurting for for alex honnell content you know <laughs> like i think there's enough shit out there it's it's freaking fine <laughs> yeah. just go rewatch free solo yeah i mean that's, so that's the best one yeah nice nice yeah. well man i really appreciate you doing this i get asked all the time if i've had you on oh. um you have this baby babbling yeah. in the monitor. Here, let me unplug okay. the, uh, the monitor real quick. I think that I'm plugging it. We'll do it. Okay. It's... <laughs> How does it? It has a life of its own. <clears throat> you would think that if you just hold on the power button, there we go. Nice. There we go. I about that, but... <laughs> Obviously, wife and baby are home. Uh, wife and baby are home. Good time to wrap up. But yeah, I get asked all the time if i've had you on particularly by my parents friends who know nothing <laughs> about climbing they're like have you had that that guy alex that, handhold guy on they're like yeah, free-handed the, the free no the guy that free-handed yellowstone <laughs> yeah. and you're like oh man <laughs> yeah i get that all the time like at corporate speaking and stuff people are like yeah you're the guy that did the thing in yellowstone and you're like yeah close close <laughs> enough yeah yeah freestyling yeah i do it all the time freestyling yeah, yeah. Really good rapper. Yeah, yeah he's off the exactly. cuff. He's amazing. Yeah. But yeah, I, I can finally say yes. So thank you. Uh, um, but no, I, I really, it's really great to meet you. I really appreciate you doing this. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, I'm looking forward to the new season of Climbing Gold as well. So I oh, appreciate it. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, my pleasure. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> cool.